this video will be talking about the idea of something being balanced and something being in rotational equilibrium, that it's not rotating or it's rotating at a constant angular velocity. An object will be balanced when the pivot point is located directly above or below the center of mass. So it could be something that is hanging, and so there the pivot point is above the center of mass. Or it could be something like this picture that, that shows this hammer-shaped object that's balancing on a pivot where the pivot point is directly below the center of mass. The important idea for balance is that the gravitational torque about the pivot point is zero. If the center of mass is directly above or below the pivot point, then the line of action is passing through the pivot point. The line of action is that line that the gravitational force is acting along. And so that line of action is vertical. And so as long as the pivot point and the center of mass are on that same vertical line, there's going to be no gravitational torque which will cause the object to tip one way or the other. This comes up with a gymnast trying to balance herself on a balance beam. She will be balanced and not tipping one way or the other when her center of mass is directly above her hands. Her hands are the point that she's going to rotate around. And so if the center of mass is directly above her hands, there's no gravitational torque that would cause her to tip and rotate counterclockwise or clockwise. As the gymnast is trying to make themselves balance, they adjust the arching of their body to adjust the center of mass. If they start tipping one way or the other, whether they realize what they're doing or not, they're adjusting themselves so that their center of mass is directly above their hands. Something tips if the center of mass is not directly over the base that's supporting the object. That base is the pivot point. Some of you may have seen the trick where someone is able to take a mostly empty can of soda and get it to balance on an angle. You are not able to do that with a completely full soda can, but it is something you can do if the can is mostly empty. The reason that you're not able to do it with a full soda can is that the center of mass of the full can is right at the center of the can. If it's completely full of liquid, then the center of mass is going to be at its center. And so with the full can, the center of mass is not directly over the base, the point where it's being supported. And so there is a net torque about the base that will cause this can to tip over. If you have a can that's mostly empty, which is what the picture is showing, the center of mass is at that blue location. It, it's at the center of where the liquid is, approximately. And so in this case, the center of mass of the mostly empty can is over the base. Again, if you are trying to do this trick, sometimes you have to add a little bit of liquid or take a little bit of liquid out so that you have just enough liquid so that the center of mass is going to be over that little edge on the can that you're trying to balance it on. This mostly empty can will balance because the center of mass is directly over the base. So something will tip when the center of mass is not over the base. There is a gravitational torque that causes it to rotate and tip over. If the center of mass is directly over the base, that gravitational force does not exert a gravitational torque. The gravitational torque is zero, which means that the can will not rotate. It will not tip. That's why it's easier to balance something that is wide as opposed to something that is narrow. If you have a wide box, then the center of mass will be over the base of the box. It's balanced if this line of action passes through the base. So in this wide object, the base is pretty long. This line of action, that the gravitational force is acting along, does pass through the base. And what ends up happening to keep it at rest, you know that the ramp pushes up. And it's going to push up on either ends, and it, these two forces aren't necessarily the same. It pushes up with just enough force to keep it from rotating, but here in this situation where the object has a wide base, it's able to keep from tipping over. If we have this narrow object, the line of action is not passing through the base. 
So there is a net torque about the bottom, and so it does tip over. Again, if you're trying to stay balanced, if you play a sport and you're trying to keep from getting knocked over, one of the ways you do that is you get a wider base so that way when a force is applied to you it does not move your center of mass enough so that now your center of mass is not over your base you you stand with a wide stance to try and give yourself as wide of a base as possible so that even if you move one way or the other that you're still balanced that your center of mass is still above your base when we talked about forces we talked about equilibrium but there we were specifically talking about linear equilibrium. If something is not moving linearly, if it's not moving up or down or left or right, or if the linear velocity is constant, then the net force acting on the object is zero. So the condition for linear equilibrium is that the net force is zero. And that would be something where the acceleration, the linear acceleration is zero. It's either at rest or it's moving at a constant linear velocity. Equilibrium also has a second piece. There's rotational equilibrium. When something is in rotational equilibrium, it's either not rotating, which is typically what we look at with equilibrium, but it could also be something that's rotating at a constant angular velocity. So it's either not rotating, so the angular velocity is zero, or it's rotating at a constant angular velocity. There's no angular acceleration. And if the angular velocity is constant or the angular velocity is zero, then the net torque must be zero. That's what we were talking about with balance. If the net torque is zero, the object is not going to rotate and tip over. You could have something that's just in linear equilibrium, but not in rotational equilibrium. Or you could have something that's in rotational equilibrium, but not linear equilibrium. So you could have either one of these cases, or you could have something where both conditions are met. Typically, if you're looking at something that is not moving at all, thinking about a bridge or something like that, you're going to need to make sure that it is in linear and rotational equilibrium. It, if it's not moving up, down, left, or right, and it's not rotating, then the net force will have to be zero, and the net torque is going to be zero. And in the next slide, we're going to look at an example of this that is something that is in both linear and rotational equilibrium. So in this problem, we have a box, and the box has a mass of 10 kilograms, and the center of mass of the box is two meters from a wall. And this box is sitting on a platform. The platform is six meters long, and the platform has a mass of four kilograms. The center of mass of the platform is going to be halfway along the platform. We're assuming that this platform is uniform. And so the center of mass of the platform by itself is going to be three meters from the wall. And then there's this rope at the end that is attached to the right end of the platform and it's also attached to the wall. And that rope is making a 30 degree angle with the platform. What we are going to calculate is we're going to calculate what is the tension in this rope if the platform doesn't rotate. And then in the second piece of the question, we're going to calculate the force that's acting at this hinge. What force does this hinge exert to keep everything stationary? So the first step is to look at all of the forces. We have the force of gravity acting on the box, 10 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So the weight of the box is 98 newtons. And that weight is acting right at the center of mass of the box, so it's acting two meters to the right of the wall. The weight of the platform is four kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, or 39.2 newtons, and that force of gravity on the platform is acting three meters to the right of the wall. And then there's this tension in this cord, and the tension in the cord has an x component and a y component. The x component is the unknown tension times the cosine of 30 degrees, and the y component is the unknown tension times the sine of 30 degrees. Again, this angle that the rope made with the horizontal is 30 degrees, so this angle between the tension and its horizontal component is also 30 degrees. So we're going to look at torque first. This platform is going to keep from rotating, and we know that if this rope wasn't there, this platform would fall down and everything would rotate clockwise on this hinge. So this hinge where the platform is connected to the wall, that's going to be our pivot point. 
So we're going to calculate the torque about this hinge. We're first going to look at the clockwise torques. The weight of the box exerts a clockwise torque on the system. The weight of the platform exerts a clockwise torque on the system. The tension in the rope is going to exert a counterclockwise torque, and so we're going to look at that in a second. But the clockwise torque, we need to find the torque due to the weight of the box and the torque due to the platform. So the torque due to the weight of the box, this force of gravity is acting straight down. This horizontal distance is perpendicular to that. So that two meters is the perpendicular distance to the line of action, or all of the force is perpendicular to the R vector of two meters. So the torque due to the weight of the box is 98 newtons times two meters. The torque due to the weight of the platform is 39.2 newtons times three meters, the horizontal distance from the wall to the center of the beam. And so the net clockwise torque, the clockwise torque only, is 313.6 newton meters. So you find the torque of the box, you find the torque of the platform, you add those two clockwise torques together, and so our overall clockwise torque is 313.6 newton meters. The only force that's exerting a counterclockwise torque is the tension in the rope. The tension in the rope is pulling at an angle. So we need to either find the perpendicular distance between the hinge and the line of action. That would be this diagonal distance, which is something that we don't really know. Or we take the component of the force that's perpendicular to the R vector. So the R vector is this horizontal vector that points from the hinge to where the rope is attached. So we want to look at this perpendicular component, the vertical component of the tension. That vertical component is T times the sine of 30 degrees. So the torque due to the rope is this vertical component, T sine 30 degrees, times 6 meters. That's the R vector. That's the distance from the hinge to the point where the tension is being applied. And if this is in equilibrium, then the clockwise torques and the counterclockwise torques have to equal each other. The net torque has to be zero. The torques have to be balanced. So T times the sine of 30 degrees times 6 meters, that counterclockwise torque, has to equal 313.6 newton meters, the clockwise torque that we found. And that gives us that the tension in the cord needed to be 104.534 newtons. That tension in the cord is pulling up at this 30 degree angle. If the tension is 104.534 newtons, that will give a big enough Y component to balance out the torques due to the weights of the box and the platform. So just looking at rotation, we were able to calculate that unknown tension. Separately, I want to talk about the force that's acting at this hinge. At the hinge, there are some forces acting, possibly in the horizontal direction, possibly in the vertical direction. We're going to look at the two components. It's possible that one of those components is zero, but the forces that are acting at the hinge are just big enough to keep this whole system in translational equilibrium. This is not moving up or down, and it's not moving left or right. If we look at our up and down forces, they don't balance. And so there's going to be some vertical force that's acting at the hinge to make sure that our vertical forces balance so that it's in linear equilibrium in the vertical direction. And because this rope is pulling horizontally and these other two forces are not acting horizontally, this wall must be pushing horizontally to cancel out that X component of the tension to keep the platform from moving back and forth horizontally. It needs to be in equilibrium in the horizontal direction as well. So this hinge has two components of forces. One of the components cancels out any vertical forces that are acting, and one of the components cancels out any horizontal forces that are acting to make the net force on this whole box platform system zero. So the X component of the force of the hinge has to cancel out the X component of the tension, T times the cosine of 30 degrees. But we know that T is 104.534 newtons, so the X component of the tension is 90.53 newtons. The tension was pulling to the left, so the hinge has to be pushing to the right with a force of 90.53 newtons. Looking at the forces in the vertical direction, we have 
98 newtons acting downward. We have 39.2 newtons acting downward. And we have T times the sine of 30 degrees. 104.534 times the sine of 30 degrees acting upwards. If you look, the two downward forces are bigger than the one upward force that we know. So the hinge has to be pulling up as well. Again, it's possible that the hinge could be pushing down. In this case, the hinge is pulling up because there's more downward force than there is upward force. So we have one upward force, 104.534 times the sine of 30 degrees. We have the two downward forces, which I'm making negative. I have this force of the hinge, and I want all four of those vertical forces to add up to equal zero. The net force in the y direction has to be zero. So the y component of the force of the hinge is 84.93 newtons. And sometimes you might just be asked, what are the x and y components of the force? But because those two forces are both being exerted by the hinge, sometimes you might be asked, what is the magnitude and direction of the force of the hinge? And that's just asking for magnitude and direction of a vector, just like before. We have the x component of the force of the hinge, 90.53 newtons. We have the y component of the force of the hinge, 84.93 newtons. We would use the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude of the overall force of the hinge. So it would be 124.132 newtons. And then we could use inverse tangent to figure out what angle the force of the hinge is acting on. The inverse tangent of the y component over the x component gives us that the force of the hinge is acting at a 43.172 degree angle above the positive x-axis. Again, it's possible that you might not have an x component or you might not have a y component. When you're balancing the torques, it's possible that the forces in the x direction might have already canceled or the forces in the y direction might have already canceled. So if the forces in the y direction had already canceled, there could be no y component acting at the hinge because that would cause it to be out of equilibrium in the vertical direction. So you have to look at all of your forces in the x and y direction and just make sure that they balance to find that unknown force. These types of problems with platforms or signs that are hanging are very important equilibrium problems because if you're going to go into engineering where you design buildings or you design bridges, you want to make sure that the bridge isn't going to collapse. And so you need to figure out how big the tension in the cables needs to be to keep the bridge from tipping over. These equilibrium problems are no different than the equilibrium problems that we did in the force chapters of multiple people pulling on a tire and finding an unknown force. We just have the extra condition that the object is not rotating, so we look at torques and we make sure that the torques balance. When we did equilibrium in those other chapters, all of the forces were acting at the center of mass, and so there was no torque. The object didn't rotate at all. Here, we have extended objects, and so we have to look at the torque that's acting on the object, including in the gravitational torques. When you look at these equilibrium problems, you're often looking at torques due to the weights of the objects, and then looking at what forces are needed to keep those objects from tipping over.